I'm Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday Monday Mindset Mindset Podcast, Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 175. And this week, it's Daisy's turn. But before we turn this over to Daisy, I just want to mention that we recognize from last week's episode that my recording might sound a bit echoey. I am in my new home in a new space that is not filled with things yet. So it's kind of echoey in here. So I apologize for the audio. Daisy? You're bouncing around all over the walls rather than... It, it won't be long before you fill it with stuff. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We'll, we'll get some, some sound absorption going in here soon. So Daisy, what do you have for us today? Well, Terry, I am back with my new to me anyway podcast that I've shared uh, one or two episodes of already, the Nudge podcast. I was scrolling back just sort of having a look basically through all the different episodes and one of them caught my eye. And uh, you'll probably have a little chuckle when I tell you what the title is. It's episode number 38, so going back quite a long way actually. Is swearing good for you? (laughs) (laughs) Love it. So no great surprise that that caught my eye and I thought it might be quite an amusing one to share. Because anyone who knows me knows that I'm quite sweary. And actually, when I got to think about it, I thought swearing actually is pretty, it really is quite an individual thing. When I was thinking about it, there are the sort of broad sweeping, you know, some people think you should never swear and some people are all for swearing. But actually, when I thought about it, I reckon we all have quite particular standards when it comes to swearing. Because when I was thinking about it, I will uphold my right to swear, but I'm reasonably choosy about when I swear. I'm quite good generally about not really swearing on the podcast. I do think there's a sort of a time and a place. And I can remember back in the day when I first started Keto Woman and the two Keto dudes were producing it for me, that any swearing that did happen would get bleeped out. And that was actually a change that when I took it over, I refused to bleep it out anymore. And for some of the reasons actually that come up in this episode, I'm going to be sharing with you. But when I thought about it, I thought I am quite particular because I can be a little bit judgy when I'm listening to somebody who I think swears a bit too much. So I think we probably all have quite a particular set of rules for swearing if we're swearers, I guess if if we're not, but some people will have a blanket policy. Nobody should ever swear. But I think for anyone who does indulge in a bit of swearing, if you have a think about it, you probably do have quite a particular set of rules for when you think it's appropriate. So although it first attracted me as to being quite, you know, just a bit of a, a bit of fun, when I thought about it, I thought, yes, I might, I think there might be some interesting things going on here. So as per usual, that's my long-winded explanation of why I chose this episode. But the guest on this episode is someone called Dr. Emma Byrne. And she has written a book called Swearing is Good for You. So I think from that, you probably get an idea of what her general stance is on the topic. And as is the norm, it seems anyway, for this podcast, they talk about all sorts of different studies And they jump straight in saying that studies show that swearing might be linked to specific parts of the brain and that some people might be more likely to swear because of this. Dr. Emma Byrne shares a story to start with about somebody called Phineas Gage, who I wasn't familiar with, but actually when I Googled him, I thought, yes, that does sound very familiar. Um, But apparently is a very famous or was a very famous rail construction worker in the US who had a really bad um, head injury. And because of that, and he survived it, because of that, that taught them, they, presumably, you know, doctors and scientists at the time, but it's basically taught us a lot about how the brain works. Apparently a, a great big long metal spike went right through his head 
he did actually survive that but his personality and behavior was changed a lot as as a consequence of that and really impacted the the rest of his life he lived for another 12 years afterwards apparently she goes on to talk about how the brain was considered as being either more like a trifle or a blancmange and the blancmangeists as she calls it thought of the brain as being one sort of quite you know jelly like mass but one mass whereas the trifleists thought of it as being made up of quite distinct components and so if you're a blamongist you would think that if you took a spoonful out of that blamonge nothing much changes you think about it if you take a big spoonful out of a blamonge nothing nothing much changes really about that blamonge does it apart from you've just made it a little bit smaller but if you've got a trifle and you remove one of the components like as she was saying if you take the sponge component out then what are you left with is it still a trifle or is it something else completely and this case of Phineas Gage showed that the trifleists were more likely correct than the blamongists so as you can see you know it really started um changing the way people thought about the brain and as i mentioned before his personality changed a lot after the accident including becoming an avid swearer it apparently took away feelings of reticence and responsibility and he no longer moderated his language in any way so the the thoughts were you know that his behavior could be linked directly to the accident And then she goes on to say the removal of certain parts of the frontal lobe affect our executive function and executive function is what moderates our behavior basically so that we act more quote unquote appropriately and this frontal lobe damage is tied to tied to our self control and apparently dementia patients are often similar have a similar progression because there is damage to this particular part of the brain and somebody called Dr Richard Stevens has done some work and some studies asking if swearing is good in a crisis or does it make it worse so is it adaptive which means helpful or maladaptive does it hinder He got a load of students to put their hands into ice baths and hold them in there for as long as possible. And one group were allowed to swear and the other group just used a neutral word. Results-wise, consistently, those who were allowed to swear could keep their hand in for a third or half as long again as the people who were using neutral words therefore there is an adaptive response it allows you to withstand pain a bit longer and they repeated this in the lab in various different ways they tried it with something called minced oaths which i heard as minced oaths i had to google it i thought surely it can't be oaths why is it minced oaths but it's minced oaths <laughs> um which apparently means an alternative to swearing so something like fudge or you know sugar so would these work in the same way so would just having the intent to swear rather than using the actual swear words work in the same way and basically no <laughs> it didn't you need the actual genuine swears to have the proper impact they also tested if emotion was involved and specifically they tested anger so they had one group playing a golf gaming app and the other group was playing a first person aggressive sort of shooter type app and the latter were more likely to be able to withstand pain so a quite uh you know aggressive emotion seemed to help as well they also tested new swear words so completely so made up swear words basically and again no 
didn't really have an impact. And as an aside there, which I thought was quite interesting, they were saying that people learning a new language often use swear words inappropriately because they don't understand the emotional impact. They use it inappropriately one way or another. So they can either be overly offensive or or use something where you know they just make themselves look a bit silly you don't you need to know those connections and actually when I thought about it I thought I thought yeah that's that's really true it's not just the words if you were just reading the words if you were learning English say you don't get the nuance do you I always find that's the thing about learning a language it's difficult to get those those nuances what's being said without saying anything Um, So basically, swearing has to be the real thing and something that you find emotive. And in those cases, it does help you withstand prolonged pain. They did talk a little bit about it's got to be a full on swear. So you can't just use a quite a lighthearted one. You've you've really got to go for it. And um, yeah, if you were a fly on the wall when I accidentally hammered my finger when I was trying to do something yeah you would hear that proper emotive swear the yeah the real big guns come out in those situations and I do think it helps (laughs) so swearing can really and has been shown with these studies has been proven to increase resilience but might it make you more trustworthy And they go on to talk about this. And basically, yes, potentially a degree of swearing shows an emotional commitment to that position, more so than more reserved language. And they went on to chat about real skilled communicators know how to harness the power of a bit of swearing. But you do have to be careful. And they cited as an example courtroom testimonies and overall those that have some swearing in them are seen to be more believable and authentic and apparently it draws on a part of the brain that deals with emotion as well as language and also interpersonal relationships swearing that is so use it with care but it can make you seem more authentic and trustworthy. And they talk a little bit about some advertising slogans and even peppering in some milder swear words like damn can make slogans more convincing and memorable. And so it can help with marketing and trustworthiness. And I thought about that. I guess it does depend what your stance is on swearing, But saying something in an advert, that's a damn fine, whatever. But it does give that little bit of impact. But what are the limits? Because as soon as I heard this and I can I can see in your body language, you're thinking, "Mm, yeah, but there there are limits. You can't just go peppering, swearing all over the place and think it's going to make you more trustworthy. It could get you into hot water. And they talked about the overuse of hand gestures. As an example, they cited a British politician called Tony Blair. But basically, they were talking about when people, um, especially, I think it applies to politicians. And he's the one that it became really obvious with, which I think is why they used him as an example. But same with language, certain hand gestures help reinforce what you're saying. And this had been used, obviously, by people training politicians to make them seem more trustworthy, more authentic, more putting the emphasis in the right place. But the problem is the hand gestures in question started to get overused. And you can probably think of all sorts of politicians who it becomes a little bit obvious they they become associated with certain hand gestures and things. And you can see how... They've just sort of been overly coached on that. So we now, it now starts, instead of denoting authenticity, it starts denoting this is a performance. And therefore, it's quite likely to have the opposite impact, i.e. not being so trustworthy. So you need to keep that 
spontaneity to be authentic. They went on to talking about swearing in the workplace and how does it differ? Uh, They talked a bit about different types of workplace and different countries. It probably won't come as much surprise to you that the places that are most likely to be quite sweary are male dominated workspaces and certain types of industry to a certain extent as well. But being male dominated is much more likely to be linked with swearing. And they also talked a little bit about whether the language you're speaking in is your first language or not. They talked about polyglot countries where there are lots of first languages. And overall, they're less likely to be sweary as a country because of this mix of languages and um, what I mentioned earlier about it being difficult to get the swearing right. We're less confident about swearing in a language that's not our first language because of the danger of inadvertently offending somebody or looking a bit stupid. And an interesting aside here that languages learned early, and in this case, that means pre-puberty, you're more likely to also have that emotional connection. So if you learn a language later in life as an adult, that's the bit that tends to be missing. So workplaces where English is predominantly the first and early learned language and is predominantly male, the workplace, banter and swearing is far more likely to be common and can be used quite effectively to motivate and bond. So language and culture are very important when it comes to whether swearing is used or not. And apparently swearing is pretty much the norm in Russian with an almost infinite number of ways to swear. Whereas in Japan, as an example, it's almost non-existent. So I thought that was quite interesting. It did get me to thinking, I wonder if, you know, thinking about if you sort of think in terms of swearing as being a bit of an outlet, especially with handling pain and things, Japan is kind of known for its quite violent comic strips and things. And I do wonder if it leeches out in different ways. But that was just a a little aside that I was thinking of. A couple of funnies here. In Germany, apparently, you can be fined up to 2,500 euros for calling somebody an old pig. And in Holland, if you are silly enough to call a police officer a cancer sufferer, you could find yourself in prison for two years. So culture differences are important. And last but not least, what about gender differences? We've already touched on this. How is swearing perceived based on gender? Eh, You probably know the answer to this already. But historically, it's been way more frowned upon for women to use swear words and even to know them. And considering Dr. Emma Byrne talks about this, she says, you know, considering the level of pain the average woman goes through, this seems a little bit unfair. You know, we're talking about withstanding pain. Well, if uh, if you're giving birth to a child, it seems only right that you should be allowed to swear with with uh, the full ferocity (laughs) that is possible. And that careful what you say, ladies are present, still does persist today. Some research done in the early 2000s by O'Neill in the US sent out questionnaires asking about various swear words and phrases. And I think they gave them the option each time for imagining whether this was a man or a woman uttering these swear words. Apparently, men and women alike judge women much more harshly for using swear words than men. And another study for women versus men going through terminal cancers or long term health conditions were far more likely to lose friends if they swear, which I thought was was particularly harsh, whereas men tend to bond more 
if they swear in the same conditions. So definitely double standards. Women use swearing as much as men, but overall, Dr. Emma Byrne was saying that women use swearing every bit as much as men, but they tend to use milder forms and they're also more careful about when and where they use it. Women are less likely to swear in front of strangers and more likely to swear in front of other women than in front of men. Uh, so the upshot is that we don't tend to use swearing, we as in women, as much in ways that could actually potentially help us. So we're, you know, we're at a bit of a disadvantage. So maybe the average woman should swear a bit more. And they ended up with a lovely quote from Emma. The host asked her, so should we all be swearing more? And her reply to this was, swearing is like mustard. It's a great ingredient, but it makes a lousy meal. <laughs> so I thought some really interesting stuff there, as well as being a bit of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Daisy, I'm wondering, did they talk at all about, I'm not even sure how to ask what I'm wanting to ask. I feel like there are some people who use swear words kind of judiciously and when they use them, they are very impactful. Mm. And other people that use them every third word, do they get as much of that resilience building or emotional relief that people who use them judiciously do like is there a difference like can I swear too often and then I lose some of the benefit of using those words well I think they kind of differentiated where you said there it wasn't a case of people who swear more often all the time on an average day are more resilient and have this pain resistant it was very specific in that moment so if you are trying to withstand pain in the moment that's when you swear very forcefully, very loudly, and it is going to help you. Okay. So if you stub your toe and your, you know, gut response is to swear extremely loudly, that is probably going to help you tolerate that pain. If you're, and I, I can remember trying this, it's uh, when I used to work in a garden center and used to lark about a bit with, with one of the guys there, and it was a particularly cold in winter. And we actually did that experiment. We put our hands, it was more of a sort of competition between us to see who could keep our hand in the frozen ice water the longest. And although we didn't swear loudly because we were in a garden centre, we were sort of swearing quietly amongst ourselves. Like, oh, I'm going to kill you fucking... <laughs> so in that kind of situation, forceful swearing is going to help you withstand that pain a little bit longer. Rather than just being somebody who swears all the time. That's not really what they were saying in the moment. And actually... As you said, the impact of those swears, when they talked about harnessing it from a trustworthiness and authenticity point of view, being really judicious about where you use it. Yeah, I think somebody is seen as being more authentic not necessarily authentic. I suppose the impact of it is what you're saying. And they didn't really talk about this, but I guess they did between the lines. You're going to lose the impact if you're trying to get a message across. And um, like they cited as an example, Bob Geldof, when they did the Band-Aid and um, I won't, it was the, it was the F word, basically. I won't let rip on the podcast, but it was show us your fucking money. And, you know, this was on national live TV. It was before the watershed. You're not supposed to use sweary language before nine o'clock at night. And so he quite famously, you know, dropped an F bomb, but it also added that impact. It really added that punch. It showed how much emotion he had behind what he was saying, how he was frustrated, how he wanted to get the message across. And so it really added impact. Whereas if, if he had just been effing and blinding through the whole thing, it would have been one, I think it gets a bit distracting and it definitely loses that impact. So it's, it's a fine balance and I'm not necessarily suggesting, and they weren't suggesting, you just start to liberally start, swearing when you're talking to your boss but you know it can potentially be added 
for impact, trustworthiness, authenticity. It's interesting you say that because I listened to an audio book that I um, believe the title is something like how to unf your brain or something like that. And there's really good content in that book. However, I found the amount of swear words and it became distracting. Mm. At first it was kind of fun and kind of like, Ooh, this is kind of irreverent and I like yeah, it. A bit edgy. <laughs> but then by like chapter three, I'm like, I cannot hear these four words anymore. Like mm. we're talking about psychological things here and it, it did, it became very distracting. Do you see what I mean about how it's quite personal what your mm -hmm. acceptable level of swearing is and what you think is useful and beneficial and what you think like you've just explained and I think I'd find the same thing where it just becomes distracting and hey stop swearing so much mm -hmm. I was just watching an episode of a show a show that I would highly recommend to anyone with Amazon Prime but um one of the main characters war had the f-bomb like every second or third word at certain parts in the show and every time there was intense emotion it was just non-stop and the other one was much more um, uptight kind of repressed and at the peak moment of emotion she yells bum <laughs> uh, and I just had to laugh because again it just kind of demonstrated this difference that even in her most intense emotive place she chose not to use mm. a more problematic word whereas the other uh, main character was using it all the time so i definitely hear you what's the show the show is called deadlock right and it's it's set in tasmania it's a great show um it's a drama but i think it's quite funny also but anyway I just noticed that difference in these two characters, how one uses language and how the other uses language. And I think I myself am more judicious when I use swear words, and I really mean it when I say it. It doesn't just roll off my tongue all the time. Uh, I broke a toe a few weeks ago, maybe almost a, a few weeks ago at this point, maybe a month ago. I certainly <laughs> used some words for emphasis at that point, but I tend not to be one who uses them in every sentence. As you know, I don't say them every time I talk to you, but when I do, you probably know there's more intensity behind what mm. I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. It reminds me, actually, I can remember one Christmas, I think it was, when when our family were all together and had a few drinks and I can remember us getting our mother to drop the C-bomb because that was that's not something that ever come out of our mouth so it, it caused much hilarity when we managed to get her to say it after quite a few glasses of wine so yes it's a it's a funny thing like I say it's a bit of fun but actually as I said at the beginning I think when most people really start digging in and thinking about it they probably do have quite a fixed set of rules mm -hmm. and so that's why i think it's a very fine line with how you're thinking about using it if you do want to um if you are using it to try an appeal to add to add impact yeah you have to be a bit careful about your mm -hmm. audience and really i think it, it probably does come back to if it's if it is just an authentic something that slips out that's going back to what I said about the podcast actually that's the reason why I stopped bleeping them I do make a as you know I'm I'm quite sweary off air but I'm you know I make an effort not to be as sweary when I'm doing the podcast I've occasionally let a few slip and I certainly would uh wouldn't stop guests on the show because they only used to tend to come out when somebody got emotional about something or somebody was, you know, talking about something that had really impacted them emotionally in some ways. And it does just add that, that edge for me anyway. But if, you know, if you're somebody who really, really does not like swearing ever and gets offended by it, I can see how, you know, that's a whole different problem. <laughs> They would probably have a hard time listening to our pre-recording conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I think it's just interesting, again, that even the kind of inoculation from pain response that 
it, it's not because you use them all the time that it happens, but it's in that moment mm. using it that, that can be helpful. Um, so I do have a few people in my life that use uh, swear words so often that, man, I'm thinking, if that's the case, they must never have pain because, <laughs> dang, they just fill every sentence. But Oh, what I do think, they pull out of the bag when they are in pain? That's probably that's right. more the question. Yeah. <laughs> they got to take it up that level. <laughs> they might even say, bum. <laughs> All right, Daisy. Well, everyone's going to be spending the next week paying attention to their use of swear words and others and, and test out these uh, things that were, you shared here. So it is a fun topic and I hope that everyone has a great week. Have an effing great week. <laughs> I can't even respond to that. <laughs> <laughs>